This is Dr. Ankur Shah, and this will be a talk on systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma. In this talk, we will give a brief overview of systemic sclerosis, otherwise and often more commonly known as scleroderma. In particular, we will cover some of the clinical features of systemic sclerosis and touch on some of what's known about the pathophysiology of this disorder. Finally, we will talk about therapeutics that are out there and how we'll use them to help our patients. Here is a basic outline of the talk. We'll start with the patient presentation and then go through the various topics listed here. Let's start with the patient case. A 35-year-old patient who is new to your clinic presents with the following symptoms. For the past one to two years, she has noticed the skin around her hands and elbows getting tighter and stiffer with some decreased range of motion. On further questioning, she also has had more indigestion and occasionally the sensation the food is getting stuck. She's also noted that her fingers have turned white and blue in the cold for the past one to two years. She thought these later symptoms were all part of being in her 30s. She states that she recently saw something on a disease called scleroderma on TV and was wondering if this is something she may have. So what is systemic sclerosis? Well, it's a heterogeneous disorder that has manifestations throughout the body. The term scleroderma is used to describe the presence of thickened, hardened skin from the Greek skleros. Scleroderma may be limited to involving only the skin and subadjacent tissues, or it may be associated with systemic involvement of internal organs. We tend to separate systemic sclerosis into two main forms depending on the extent and type of organ involvement. Limited systemic sclerosis is also known as CREST syndrome an acronym based on a few of the major manifestations. Patients will have calcinosis with calcium deposition in the skin and other locations. They may have Raynaud's phenomenon due to vascular spasm or occlusion. The vascular spasm leads to a characteristic whiteness of the skin followed by the blue appearance with depletion of oxygen and then finally red during reperfusion. This form of scleroderma also has esophageal dysmotility. Sclerodactyly, is there due to fibrosis and sclerosis of the fingers, and finally, telangiectasias appear as small, dilated blood vessels at the skin surface. In limited systemic sclerosis, skin involvement is usually limited to the face, neck, and extremities distal to the elbows and knees. The most serious consequence of limited sclerosis is pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to significant morbidity and mortality. Diffuse systemic sclerosis is most commonly referred to as scleroderma. In diffuse systemic sclerosis, the skin involvement is more diffuse involving the proximal extremities as well as the face and the trunk. Compared to limited systemic sclerosis, there is an increased risk of internal organ involvement. The most severe manifestations include pulmonary fibrosis, renal crisis, which is the acute onset of renal failure in the setting of severe hypertension, GI involvement, mostly esophageal, and heart involvement, which may lead to arrhythmias. Finally, joint and muscle involvement is also observed in diffuse systemic sclerosis. Fortunately, systemic sclerosis is a fairly rare disease with a prevalence of only 50 to 300 per 1 million people. The incidence is approximately 2 to 3 per 1 million people per year. As with many autoimmune and rheumatologic disorders, there is a higher rate of systemic sclerosis in women at a rate that has been reported of up to 14 to 1 compared to men. In terms of race, black women tend to have earlier disease onset, more severe disease, and worse survival outcomes. Pregnancy may be a predisposing factor for developing systemic sclerosis. Some have proposed that perhaps exposure to fetal DNA may be a triggering event, although this has been far from proven. The specific pathophysiology at the cellular level is not well known, but has been divided into early and late stages. One of the initiating events includes vascular injury, primarily of the small vessels or arterioles. This vascular injury is likely inflammatory or autoimmune damage, which produces large gaps in the endothelial wall of the vessels. Pathologic specimens reveal vacuolization of endothelial cell cytoplasm and infiltration of mononuclear inflammatory cells into the perivascular space. During the early period, there is also decreased vasculogenesis or generation of new vessels 
which can be due to a combination of cytokine production and autoantibody generation. In the late stages of the disease, the areas of inflammation are replaced by fibrosis and collagen deposition in an environment of persistent oxidative stress. The fibrosis tends to begin in the lower dermis and upper subcutaneous layer with the loss of microvasculature. Over time, the architecture of this matrix changes with fibrillin found early on and type 1 collagen replacing it later. This is a schematic diagram of the process I just described. As immune mechanisms damage the endothelium, there may be no symptoms. As damage progresses with influx of white blood cells and fibroblasts, there may be some vascular manifestations such as Raynaud's phenomenon. As the process progresses, collagen is laid down and fibrosis begins along with apoptosis of endothelial cells. As the end stages of the disease are reached, the fibroblasts and immune cells are gone, replaced by deposited collagen and leaving decreased vascular lumen size. These changes likely play a role in end organ damage. So how do we diagnose systemic sclerosis? The diagnosis is mostly clinical. In 1980, the American College of Rheumatologists devised preliminary criteria for the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, as shown here. To fulfill the criteria for systemic sclerosis, one must have either proximal scleroderma, known as the major criterion, or two out of three minor criterion, which include distal sclerodactyly, digital pitting scars, or evidence of bilateral pulmonary fibrosis on chest x-ray. Other features, in particular Raynaud's phenomenon, which is experienced by virtually all systemic sclerosis patients, is also included in the criteria. This slide shows major clinical features of systemic sclerosis. The photos on the left demonstrate the progression of Raynaud phenomenon. With vasospasm, the fingers develop significant pallor that can be sharply delineated. Over time, lack of oxygenated blood perfusion, the fingers will turn blue. What isn't shown here is that the resolution of vasospasm, fingers can turn bright red. However, prolonged ischemia can occur leading to tissue loss and digital ulcerations. The picture in the top right demonstrates scleroderma of the arm. The skin can take on a hard, shiny appearance and can often have a mottled salt and pepper look. Additionally, due to fibrosis and occasionally tendon involvement, there can be significant decreased range of motion of the joints. On auscultation of the tendons around these joints, one can occasionally hear a rubbing or grinding noise known as a tendon friction rub. The picture in the lower right corner represents an endoscopic view of a peptic stricture that can be seen in systemic sclerosis. Such strictures can be severe, leading to inability to swallow, and in some cases, leading patients to require a feeding tube or parenteral nutrition. In addition to the clinical findings, lab values may aid in the diagnosis. Over 90% of patients with systemic sclerosis have autoantibodies, the vast majority of which fall under the category of antinuclear antibodies, or ANAs. Thus, the ANA is the first test to order as it has a high sensitivity, so if negative, then one may consider a diagnosis other than systemic sclerosis. More specific autoantibody tests can then be ordered to help support the diagnosis and aid with prognosis, although there can be overlap between systemic sclerosis types as noted in this picture. The autoantibodies include the anti topor isomerase 1, which is also known as the anti SCL70. Anti SCL70 autoantibodies can be seen in both limited and diffuse systemic sclerosis, but are more associated with the diffuse type. Anti SCL70 is associated with increased mortality, increased disease severity, and pulmonary fibrosis. Anti centromere antibodies are almost exclusively seen in the limited systemic sclerosis type, and their presence is associated with a greater prevalence of pulmonary hypertension than in other forms of the disease. Anti-RNA polymerase is an anti-nucleolar antibody seen almost exclusively in diffuse systemic sclerosis. It is associated with renal involvement and increased mortality. Anti-U1-RNP and anti-PMSCL are less common autoantibodies in systemic sclerosis. When seen, these autoantibodies are associated with inflammation of the muscles as well as pulmonary fibrosis. Once we have diagnosed systemic sclerosis, what can we do about it? 
Unfortunately, there is not evidence of efficacy for many therapeutics for systemic sclerosis. Prednisone is often given, but there is some concern that high-dose prednisone can actually predispose to developing renal crisis. Whether this association is due to an actual causal effect or whether the use of steroids is simply a marker of higher disease activity is unclear. A number of other immunosuppressants, including methotrexate, mycophenolate mofetil, cyclosporin, and imatinib, have been used and have been successful in limited small trials. The last of these, imatinib, works through decreasing fibrosis by targeting the platelet-derived growth factor and TGF-beta pathways, both thought to be important in the progression of symptoms. There have been larger trials for improving the fibrotic lung disease and systemic sclerosis, which, as mentioned, can lead to significant morbidity and even death. The scleroderma lung study was one of the largest treatment trials in systemic sclerosis. This study showed that oral cyclophosphamide was better than placebo in improving outcomes in pulmonary fibrosis. Mycophenolate mofetil also shows promise for treating pulmonary fibrosis and systemic sclerosis. Acute renal disease, or scleroderma renal crisis, is thought to be a renin-mediated process. Thus, ACE inhibitors are used to bring down the patient's blood pressure, which can lead to improvement. Given the lack of highly effective therapeutics, what is the clinical course for this disease and the overall prognosis? Compared to the general population, there is a five to eight times higher risk of death at any age in patients with systemic sclerosis. If a patient develops pulmonary disease alone, without cardiac or renal involvement, the median survival is 78 months with a 50% mortality at eight years. There's also an overall increased risk of lung cancer in all patients for which patients should be monitored for. In summary, the important aspects to take away from this talk is that systemic sclerosis is a rare progressive disease primarily involving fibrosis of the skin as well as internal organ damage. Almost all patients have Raynaud's phenomenon and there is a high prevalence of autoantibodies which may help predict outcomes. If patients are lacking autoantibodies or Raynaud's phenomenon, consider alternate diagnoses. There are numerous clinical manifestations of systemic sclerosis. In particular, pulmonary fibrosis can lead to significant mortality and morbidity. Finally, effective treatments are lacking, but immunosuppressants are employed, particularly for treatment of severe end organ damage. And here are some key references for which you can read to learn more about systemic sclerosis and scleroderma.